Um, but but the, the, the UNE School of Law's achievements in teaching and learning are particularly important, and it's very exciting to celebrate that fact this year, um, a year of proposed constitutional reform. I don't imagine that serendipitous timing was foreseen by the founders, but it's exciting nonetheless. In order to develop this proposition as to why I think that UNE School of Law is particularly special, I need to breach my own rule for after dinner speaking, which is never talk about yourself. But I, I need to explain how special this law school is by reference to my own early experience at the bar. I went to the bar in 1991, and it won't surprise anyone here to learn that there were fewer female barristers then than there are now especially in the field of commercial law in which I practised as a senior junior. And there were certainly no people of colour, no religious diversity. I commonly had clients say to me, oh, I've never met a lady barrister before. And some of my friends who are a bit younger than me but came through with perhaps a bit more feminist confidence than I had um, actually developed a game called Lady Barrister Bingo, which is a, where you have a list of the things that people might say to you when you walk into court as a lady barrister and you cross them off, like, who's at home with the children? Um, Good morning, ladies, you're looking lovely, and so on. Um, in 1993, the year this law school was established, I was lucky enough to secure a room on the sixth floor Selborne Chambers. And one of my early experiences on that floor was I was um, out in the reception area one morning collecting my own mail and a, a six-pack of Freehills solicitors came into the reception area and they took one look at me and they said, we're here to see Mr Bathurst. Oh. And I said, certainly, I'll just go and tell him. And I pretended, as they obviously assumed, that I was the receptionist and I went and told Mr Bathurst that his clients were here and he very kindly came out and, and told them that I was one of the new barristers on the floor. But it sounds like I'm complaining and I'm not. Um, people assume that it must have been very hard during that time, but it wasn't. And that's because I was mostly appearing against complacent white men. And, and, they, and, and, and they, thank you. And they, they, were, they were very kind to me in sharing stories of some of their greater forensic triumphs. And I learned a lot from those stories perhaps not always the lesson intended to be conveyed by the raconteur, but um, I found that I could make up for the obvious disadvantage of being a woman with cunning little tricks of the trade which I learned, which my older male opponents had obviously overlooked, such as reading the whole of the brief before I went to court, <laughs> or, or keeping up with some of the more obscure developments in the law, such as the introduction of the Evidence Act 1995, <laughs> Still, still referred to in many quarters as the New Evidence Act. <laughs> as a senior junior, I began to re receive briefs in commercial matters, and that was a game changer because commercial barristers charged by the hour, so they did read their briefs, and, and that meant that I had to be cunning. I once asked a solicitor to bring a particular volume of the Commonwealth Law Reports to court and to put a post-it note in a particular page. And she said, which volume and which page? I said, it doesn't matter, uh, I, it, in, any volume. I just want my opponents to think that there's a principle of the High Court that they have missed. <laughs> so we, we played a game where we thought we'd watch for how, how long it would take for the male barristers, of whom there were seven at the bar table, to get anxious about this volume of the Commonwealth Law Reports that I'd placed right next to my lectern. And by morning tea, seven clerks from seven floors of barristers had brought seven copies of volume 144 <laughs> of the CLRs to, to court 11. But the, the mostly male barristers at the Sydney Bar in the 1990s really had no idea how homogenous they were. In those days, if you acknowledged the traditional custodians of the land in a room full of Sydney barristers, they thought you were referring to them. <laughs> and you'd have to explain aspects of Australian history um, from the period before 1951, which was the year a wealthy Melbourne businessman imported two Porsches to Australia, making Australia a target for the Porsche um, import, uh, export territory. And, and you'd have to explain that before that there were some fairly significant um, features of Australian history such as invasion, dispossession, removal of children, diversion of income and so on. Um, and no doubt um, 
the bar was strong in other ways in Sydney in those days. But what it lacked, and this is really my point, is, is the strength of diversity. The establishment of regional law schools, and uh, uh, among which Armadale is, is an obvious contender, but there were others, University of Newcastle in 1992, University of Wollongong in 1991, was a step that has provided that strength of diversity in legal education. And, and it is a real strength. Access to learning provided to a significantly broader audience than what Americans would call the Ivy League schools, so um, Sydney Law School and a certain law school which I attended, as you were kind enough to note, um, New South Wales. Um, it, it is important not just because it makes legal education accessible to a broader range of people, but it makes a broader range of people accessible to the legal profession, and that's the real strength of, a, of, a, of, of regional law schools. At the time UNE was established, there were concerns expressed that there were too many law students. Heaven forbid that a generation of young people from all over the state, nay the country and indeed ultimately internationally, should develop a better understanding of the law. One way of testing the proposition that there is strength in diversity is to examine what was written about familiar topics during the pre-UNE School of Law era. These words were written in 1985 by a man who was then a barrister and is now a former High Court judge. We'll call him Dyson. <laughs> a, a, a woman, this is a quote from 1985, a woman jilted by a man may revenge herself by falsely alleging rape. A spitefully motivated woman may allege a sex crime as the best way of destroying a man. The complainant may desire notoriety on the basis that it is better to be raped than ignored. These words were written by a Sydney judge in 2012. With the passage of time, the extent to which social deprivation in a person's youth and background can be taken into account... Sorry, I'll say it again. With the passage of time, the extent to which social deprivation in a person's youth and background can be taken into account must diminish. Many in the room will recognise that as the judgement of the court. court I'll have to speak up. Court of Criminal Appeal in um, Bugmy, which famously was overturned by the High Court. But the point is that the judge in question who said those words grew up in Mossman, attended Riverview College, one of the nation's most prestigious schools, and then went to Sydney University, one of the world's most prestigious universities. Mr Bugmy's schooling, by contrast, was at Wilcannia, one of the poorest towns in New South Wales. It was interrupted permanently in Year 7 when he was sent to jail for the first time. And it took the courage of Bob Belair, appointed to the District Court in 1996 as Australia's first Aboriginal Australian judge, to remark that that particular judge was not well qualified to sit in judgment of the effects of grinding poverty and disadvantage. These words were spoken by a male magistrate in 1999. Women cause a lot of problems by nagging, bitching and emotionally hurting men. <laughs> men cannot bitch back, for hormonal reasons, and often have no recourse but violence. So let me examine the, the power of change. And, and this brings me back to my theme of the importance of regional universities and the accessibility of education to a broader range of people. These words were spoken by a US judge, Carlton Reeves, who in 2010 became the second African-American appointed as a federal court judge in Mississippi, a, a state, as many of you would know, um, plagued for for a long time by the, the scourge of lynchings of um, black Americans. He was a, a black judge and he read these remarks to three young white men before sentencing them for the death of a 48-year-old black man um, who had effectively been lynched and then had his body run over um, as they yelled white power. He wrote carefully and at length about the history of lynching in Mississippi and drew on his own study um, as history as his second degree from law about um, historical writings that between 1882 and 1968 
an estimated 4,742 blacks met their death at the hands of lynch mobs. Um, that number contrasted with 1,401 prisoners who'd been executed legally in the United States in modern times. And it represented more than those killed in Operation Iraqi Freedom and twice the number of American casualties in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. It also represented 1,700 more than those killed in September 11. He concluded the common denominator of the deaths of these individuals was not their race. It was not that they were all engaged in freedom fighting. It was not that they had been engaged in criminal activity, trumped up or otherwise. No, the common denominator was that the last thing each of these individuals saw was the inhumanity of racism. Such courage is often the product not only of a deeper understanding of history and context, but of the lived experience of the people who are judging these matters. And, and that brings me back to my theme and, and the importance of diversity in legal education and the importance of regional universities. And, and coming back to what I said at the outset about, the, um, about my own acknowledgement of the traditional custodians, and the particular significance that you're celebrating this 30th year in the year of proposed constitutional reform. As lawyers, and particularly as lawyers who represent a more diverse collection of the community, I think this year we have a particular responsibility for leadership in the move to constitutional reform. I'm, I'm not going to stand here and tell anyone how they should vote, yes, but, um, but I, I, I am going to say that as lawyers who are educated, we need to take responsibility for educating people who don't understand the significance of the constitutional reform reflected in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. We need to read the learned speeches of people such as Murray Gleeson, who came out very early with a, a paper explaining that this was not a dramatic or radical constitutional step. A more recent paper from Robert French, also a former Chief Justice of the High Court, about how modest these reforms are. And whether you agree or disagree, as lawyers we have a responsibility to educate ourselves in those reforms Thank you. And, and to um, explain to people who don't understand what is involved, what is involved. And that is the kind of leadership that a school like UNE um, cultivates in the diversity of its students and its teachers. And so I come back to where I began and congratulate you for 30 years of uninterrupted learning and teaching. And, and finally, a shout out to my new best friends on a title like that. <laughs> Thank you. typical, the perfect timing for a microphone or two. Thank you for doing the batteries, etc. Paul Sattler, would you like to come and offer an official uh, vote of thanks? Uh, Paul, many of you will know, has been teaching with us for a number of years, but Paul is currently the LLB course convener, so he deals a lot of the nitty-gritty with our LLB students. Paul, you. Thank you, Michael. Um, my task tonight is twofold. Firstly, to congratulate, or firstly, to thank Her Honour, Justice McCallum for coming to be with us this evening. You've come a long way, Your Honour. Thank you. Or judge, I should say, off the bench. Um, your speech was a wonderful mix of, of, of humour, insight and inspiration. Thank you. And this wasn't in what I planned to say, but your, your comment about the CLR reminds me. I did a lot of work with the Aboriginal Legal Service and Legal Aid around the northwest of New South Wales. I won't name the town. But the prosecutor there, the police prosecutor, was known as something of a, an old, you know, been around a long time. And I showed up and I had under my arm a, a CLR, which is a leather-bound Commonwealth law report. And he, he said to me as I walked in, hang on, you're not about to start arguing law in this place, are you? <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> Your Honour, thank you for being with us this evening. It really is inspirational for our law students and for we have, and we have quite a few of them here this evening and people like myself and my colleagues and guests to hear from someone of your stature. Thank you so much. <laughs> then I had delusions of grandeur and had decided, decided to go to the bar and I got a phone call one day saying, could you come and work for us for six months? Fifteen years later, I'm still here. 
and I love it. I love it. And this town to me is special. The first settler, my surname is Sattler, who came to Australia, Jakob in German, my family heritage is German, Jacob, settled in Armidale. There's a street here named after my family. So this town to me is special. This university is special. And this law school is very special to me. So I'd like you to be upstanding, please. And I propose a toast to the School of Law at the University of New England. School of Law.